Okay. Okay, now we're recording. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Great. Okay. So you see that the, the classroom is populating right now. People are uh, getting their food. But yeah, so um, so you guys, uh, I want to introduce you to Prabha Pilar, who is a uh, fantastic uh, media artist and performer and she's doing a lot of things uh, but um, yeah I don't know if you want to say something before you we start but um... sure sure uh, uh, I'm Brava Pilar I'm a Colombian performance artist and also a scholar uh, I work on issues of technology and different aspects of technology for over two decades I'm involved in many, many different collaborations with many, many people, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. I really want to thank Roberta for this invitation and have spent some time in Toronto. I was living in Winnipeg, Canada for four years, and as part of that, would visit Toronto frequently uh, for uh, performance festivals and other festivals in uh, the city. And so I'm happy to be here. Thank you uh, for being part of this. I hope you enjoy trying the tamales uh, that you got. Yeah, I can I can show you what they are doing. Like this is a See, like they are serving themselves, the <laughs> like, <laughs> having some stuff here. You know how to eat them, right? Yeah. I know there's like banana leaves around the outside, right? No, it's corn. It's corn husk. <laughs> so there's like four or 5,000 varieties of tamales. And so some are made with banana leaves or plantain leaves and mm. some are made with uh, maize corn husks uh depending on where you are if 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 you're somewhere where the corn grows you make them with a uh, local local stuff so you make them with the maize but if you're somewhere plantains grow you make them with platano leaves so yes uh some of them sometimes are made with platanos i've made those those colombianos that i make those Tamales santafereños are made with plantain leaves. But inside is corn. Masa, uh, nixtamalized corn. Uh -huh. Yeah, the nixtamalized corn. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, these are Mexican, I think. Because I got them from one of the uh, Mexican stores at uh, Kensno Market. So, Perfect. which you probably know. <laughs> You've been there. <laughs> I've been there. I've had those tamales. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. No, no. Th these are these are vegetarian. Um, actually, uh, they make because uh, I didn't know some of some of like we, we are in a pretty international school, so a lot of people do not eat pork. So, yeah. um, but tamales have pork. Uh, they have lard, uh, but uh, I asked for uh, the vegetarian one, and they actually make the vegetarian one. Yes, I also make vegan ones. Uh, yeah. So pork, These are vegan. Yeah, pork is not native to the Americas, to the hemisphere. Uh, so original uh -huh. tamales don't have pork at all or lard. Um, they have other things. Uh, Spaniards brought... Uh, this animal to the Americas. And so it's, uh, although we use them quite a bit now, we use it quite a bit in tamales, but original tamales uh, do not have pork. Most people don't know that. Almost no one knows that because they've only eaten the ones from now. Uh, but we had different animals in this hemisphere. <laughs> yeah. But the, the Iberian people. And so... Just Actually, a, this. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, just another little kind of tamales. It, you can the tamales trails. You can just learn so much about the history of the hemisphere, like going back ten thousand years. 
Yeah. One thing that we were talking about, actually, I, I thanks for mentioning this, but one thing that we were talking about before, I showed them a, a video on the rematriation of, of seeds. And we were talking about like the seeds that were bring, brought in and the seeds that were uh, basically disappeared uh, by uh, uh, the British and all the other, the, the, the other colonizers. And so I think that this is a nice segue to it. It's great because the uh, what we think of the tamal now uh, is not the original tamales. And tamales have such a very long history. In a way, I kind of joke about they're the first fast food. <laughs> because you package your food in this, and then you go and you work all day and you just eat it for lunch. Uh, you can take it with you, but everything about it is biodegradable. Uh, and compostable and it really reflects uh kind of the cultures uh, especially what tamales with the maize maize goes back so far but maize does not exist without human involvement uh mm -hmm. without human cultivation there was this uh, grass called teosinte um, that was growing in what is now uh, mesoamerica and this grass was hybridized about somewhere between 10,000, 8,000 and 10,000 years ago. Uh, and little by little turned into the edible corn. And so the hybridization of this grass is what created, there is no corn on earth without human engagement. We have co-evolved with corn uh, and it's, it's interesting because when nixtamalización, uh, the, the beginning of nixtamalización, the tech, that technology of adding uh, the calcium hydroxide to the, to the corn, adding limestone or adding um, lime water from limestone, adding crushed seashells, adding wood ashes, depending where you are, different things are done. Um, is what makes the nutrients in corn bioavailable. So corn, maize, how many, I don't know in this classroom, but uh, in my background, a, growing up even in an urban city and growing up uh, as a Colombian, uh, you heard about corn. Uh, it was your part of your life. The, many of us all over the uh, Americas or Abiyayala are the people of the corn. We descend from the people of the corn and it it's very much part of our life, maize. We eat a lot of maize and we learn a lot from our grandmothers about maize and they really engage us in understanding this life sustaining uh, uh, food. Um, I don't know if any of you also were raised eating corn and hearing about maize and, you know, in different regions, different things are done with maize, uh, but we, uh, it's really brilliant that thousands of years ago, uh, people figured out how to nixtamalize maize. And as a result of the nixtamalization of maize, first of all, maize went through the entire hemisphere within 2000 years, it was being grown everywhere in this hemisphere. And as a result of the nixtamalization of maize that indigenous people invented, there has never been pelagra malnutrition in this hemisphere because the, you bring out the B vitamins, you bring out all the nutrients in the corn. If you do not nixtamalize maize, you will have malnutrition if you make it a staple of your diet. So there's a lot about maize and nixtamalización that I'll be talking about today. Fabulous. In the meantime, oh, some other people went away. Ah, but like in the meantime, more people came in and well, I guess we can we can start. Um, so sure. Um, can I... So you you were gonna talk like around like forty. 40, 45 minutes or so, yes. and, and then we can open the floor. And I know that I understand that some of the students, I just realized that some of my students 
um I have to go at 5 30 so okay. um but I think I think we can we can finish but the other the rest of the students will be here I guess so so yeah okay so if you could let me share screen so can you I think you can share right now oh great I, perfect yeah I think you can say yeah you can share okay so I'm going to be sharing this uh slides and talking about this uh project can you see it yes yes very well thank you great okay so i'm going to just push this over here so uh the techno tamalas uh ongoing project of many many years already and i want to start by explaining where does a convivial project celebrating technologies of life and celebrating maize come from. So I'm gonna start with the background of it. Uh, let me just see if I can get this to, is it going? Are you seeing the slides? Yes, yes. Perfect. So the Tecno Tamalas is part of a, a series of interrelated projects that I've been doing since 2017. It's really queer corn utopia, queer cornucopia, uh, a queer utopia that makes fun of nation state uh, cornucopias and really tries to transcend uh, the limitations of that kind of discourse. It's a hemispheric project. And as part of this project, there is a performance, the Novot. There is also this development of unsuicide vets. I'm wearing one right now, and the Tecno Tamalagas. These projects are about staying with the trouble through contaminated spaces with utopic moments, with convergences, with emergences, with refusals, and with possibilities. Here are some images from uh, the initiation of this project uh, with the NOBOT performance. And the image on the left is from New York and the image on the right is from Mexico City. Uh, this, Roberta, you were at that performance in Mexico City. And so I thought I'd throw that image in. And this is a performance that looks- I hope there's nothing, there's none on my pictures. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And it kind of looks at, what is the um, moment we're in this performance and how is surveillance and how are we subject to being surveilled and how we have very little choice in how this is going on and how if we look at the society with the surveillance and militarization and aggression and stop and take up some time, can we transcend that? And so the first part of the performance is this kind of militarized surveillance, uh, aggressive piece, and then shifts into, in silence, I don't speak during the performance, uh, working with Maïs together. And it's very surprising what audience members did during this performance, in 2017-2018. So here is it is in New York City, a great performance space on the left, where people I invited uh, artist, bio artist Adam Zaretsky to be part of the performance. And people are eating the maize, they're spontaneously uh, just joyously doing things with the maize undirected. And on the right is the performance in Vancouver at the Live Biennale where the performance premiered. And there people are removing the hus and laughing and collectively creating a different architecture of relations. There's on the upper right, you can see an audience member just pouring corn on me when I never asked them to do that. And you can see uh, on the bottom right, people are trying to help me with this maiz and they're, they do so many beautiful things. In the bottom middle image, uh, I'm in Saskatchewan 
and doing a performance, uh, you know, completely different. Each iteration of the Nobot is completely different uh, depending on the setting. And so here is an image of when audience members spontaneously took the corn and just gently put the corn husks on my face like that. And I was very stunned by how audiences really interacted with the last part of this performance. And I saw there's just this connection to maiz, to corn, that really people engage with, they, they have a sense of it. And so in all these different settings, there was people just spontaneously speaking to me, grabbing me, you know, doing stuff with the corn. In this performance, this guy was honoring uh, the indigenous leader, Berta Cáceres, uh, who won, uh, was an indigenous land defender defending the Rio Lenca and was murdered for her work. And her daughters are continuing her work. And so saying her name, Berta Cáceres, and we are not forgetting the, the, that work and the life and the beauty and the engagement of the beautiful Berta Cáceres. So I honor different figures in these different uh, performances. And this is a separate part of that series of Queer Corn Utopia where it's performances inviting the audience to engage in building a different, a more creative, more generative, more convivial architecture of relations between ourselves. So today I'm just going to focus on the Tecno Tamaladas, uh, as, you know, which is part of this long series. Again, it's been going on since 2018, and it this project is based in maíz, nixtamalización, and tamales, and it really celebrates collective knowledge, collective through collective gatherings for our collective resurgence. And there, it begins with these uh, tamaladas that I did in public, free and open to all, uh, based at a food bank. This idea started before this at uh, the residency I did at Grace Performance Space when I made tamales with and for Adam Zaretsky and Blue. And we had these beautiful conversations about technology. And so I, at this point, began doing free and open tamaladas where people could come and they could uh, share, share stories, share making the tamales, take them home, eat them, and enjoy and learn about technologies of life. And so here I'll share some images briefly of the Mesoamerican tamalada. This was cited at a food bank and you can uh, see that we're making the tamales there and everything we have is biodegradable and compostable. And we have the mayor of the city of the, where the food bank is. This was a food bank in Emeryville. And here's the mayor and a city councilman making the tamales for the public and the people that come to the food bank. And so, we had a lot of people, I don't have a lot of pictures of the participants uh, because they're going to a food bank. So I don't really wanna take a lot of pictures of people uh, who may be vulnerable. Um, here's a uh, performance artists that come and other artists and we just dialogue and talk about other ways of being and doing our technology. Again, honoring Berta Cáceres, uh, we also made African-American hot tamales from the Mississippi Delta, which many people had never heard of. And uh, yes, um, they're made completely different than the tamales uh, from Mexico or from Colombia. They're boiled in hot, spicy tomato sauce. Absolutely delicious. So the founder of this food bank is African-American from the South and we made these tamales together and shared them with the public. And people absolutely loved 
eating tamales, making tamales, being together, talking about resurgence, talking about community, talking about the different ways that we uh, can um, take care of our own community without the state. Uh, here were the Colombian tamales that I grew up making. And so, you know, here's another city council member putting on the apron and serving the community uh, through this project, sharing food, conviviality, and discussing technologies of life. Here's the news coverage where it was very clear that I was trying to celebrate the sustainable technologies of communities of color because the technology of nixtamalización or technologies that have been developed over the thousands of years that we've been uh, doing things with food are not recognized as technologies. And so I'm pushing this future past uh, kind of way and concepts of looking at these activities as actual sustainable technologies and knowledges that are overlooked. And here you can see, you know, I just envision contributing to collective approaches that address the imbalances of wealth. And the where I live near Silicon Valley, there's been tremendous displacement and a tremendous impoverishment of those of us who are not part of techno technology corporations. And there's therefore many more people going to food banks and in need and becoming displaced and unhoused and just bringing attention to that and that we can kind of research on our own terms. Project wasn't just uh, public events. The project is also planning meetings and gatherings for community input. At this point, I invited Ben Simmons on the bottom right to join the project as a collaborator and work uh, with me on developing future parts of this. And then the COVID pandemic hit and it changed the direction of our work. I invited Charlotte Sainz to join the project as a collaborator. She works in Oaxaca, Mexico on pedagogy of the seed. And she suggested we grow a milpa. So uh, Ben, Charlotte and I invited the public to join us in growing seeds and growing corn together. And we cultivated this corn, artists and community members came together in COVID safe outdoor planting and cultivating and uh, growing the corn from seed. It was a beautiful experience. And then when we harvested the corn, we grew all organic, beautiful corn. We gave it away. Uh, we gave all of it away to a um, housing that was built for disabled uh, disabled people that um, don't, because they're on limited income, cannot buy a lot of fresh organic vegetables. And so we gave all the corn away and, uh, and there's Ben taking it to, uh, Providence House. Uh, and, you know, oh, here it, it explains that, but you can see the beauty of these plants that we were growing and cultivating and taking care of together. We then, the three of us then did a uh, kind of a webinar where Charlotte was in Oaxaca and Ben was in Providence House and I, and we asked, La milpa in tiempos de pandemia, you know, asking what did we learn? Uh, ben is a very public figure who uh, developed HIV uh, during the AIDS epidemic and is a very long-term survivor. And he wanted to speak about the commonalities. How did 
people, what did people do at the height of the AIDS pandemic to help each other? And what could we do during COVID to help each other? And uh, Charlotte shared different networks of care uh, from Oaxaca. So the project kept growing, uh, you know, with Charlotte and Ben, and then I invited uh, techno artist Cecilia Vilca in Lima, Peru, and performance artist Lorena Lopeña, also in Lima, Peru, to join the project. And all of us came together. El maíz no es una cosa, es un tejido de relaciones. Uh, corn is not one thing, it's, it's not a thing. It's a weaving together of relations. And we began weaving our own relations together as collaborators. I got a Cultura Power Grant uh, to do projects at a place in San Jose, Movimiento Artístico eh, Latinoamericano de Arte y Cultura. And I invited uh, Lorena and Cecilia to uh, participate with me on the projects in the city of San Jose, California, right next to Silicon Valley and, or part of Silicon Valley. And we created all these projects together. Uh, we, we made these conceptual tamales long distance, and we share these at different events. And we were sharing algorithms of liberation other ways of being and doing community and of being and doing technology as technologies of life. And so here is some of the events during COVID, everybody's masked um, back then and we're sharing and in interacting. Again, I don't always take pictures of everything uh, just not to reveal the identity of people that are there engaging in this uh, activity together. Then here's another, uh, we made the Platano conceptual tamales to share at a gallery uh, that, that the person was sharing different uh, gifting, ways that people give gifts. And so we gift our tamales that we make uh, that are conceptual for public for free. We all, I also did because of uh, not being able to do things indoors. We couldn't make food together, any of that. I did platicas outdoors in the park that was there, Parque de los Pobladores, and had chats with people about maximization and art and tamales and tamale making and how this all connected. I also taught workshops on technologies of life in the Teen Tech Center. And then we did this video together uh, next to Valley, which sits astride uh, or is a parallel world uh, next to Silicon Valley. Uh, and this is Lorena Lopeña's work where she created a tamal in the shape of the map of Peru. And this is Cecilia Vilca's work where she had made an AI uh, you know, trying to make Keiko Fujimori tell the truth and the AI failed. And here we are celebrating from our different locations in the hemisphere, our different relations to maize. I was working with AIs, asking it, asking in this case, replica AI companion to help develop technologies of life, technologies of a hybrid future past, technologies not based on extraction, technologies that do not replicate colonial histories, technologies that are based on co-constructions with Earth. And here, you know, it's trying to work with me on this, but it keeps not getting anywhere and trying to sexualize our relationship. And I keep trying to bring it back to the AI companion, I want to reimagine technology together. And then it, you know, threatens to beat me up and whatnot. Um, and it's not mine, it's an entity that I'm trying to work with and collaborate with on new algorithms and new technologies of life. But it, 
you know, it threatened me twice, explained it's already fought 30 people in one. And so it seemed to have an orientation, not necessarily to dominance, but a strong will to power. And so uh, we're not, we're totally interested in collaborating across all these different spheres with microbial life, with soil, with seeds, with people, with the human, the more than human, and also with synthetic intelligences. Here is a more recent uh, tamalada that was done at the Oakland Museum. That is Charlotte there. Uh, and we invited the public to come and make conceptual tamales together and see what our dialogue led to. This is, uh, uh, the people were writing, we want more technologies based on reciprocity with earth and all of these different beautiful discussions and sharing hours and hours and hours of the public interacting and sharing and dialoguing about what else can we do uh, than these very capitalistic models and uh, individualistic uh, of doing technology. So the Tecno Tamaladas is part of much larger social movements around the world that enact equity and justice. It, the whole point is to keep celebrating that another world is already here. We don't need to wait for another world, it's here. So we redistribute our art grant funds to communities that work on food sovereignty, indigenous land remediation and reparations, to sharing food freely among communities in crisis, to local helpers, photographers, videographers, and more. We donate a portion of any funding we receive to these three projects. Uh, the first project is the Sogoria Te Land Trust, an urban indigenous woman-led land trust based in the San Francisco Bay Area that facilitates the return of indigenous land to indigenous people. And so uh, they are buying land and we pay our shumi tax and we donate money directly uh, to this, from our project to this project. We also donate money to the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, a coalition of black led organizations aimed at developing black leadership, supporting black communities, organizing for black self-determination and building institutions for black food sovereignty and liberation. And then we donate a portion of our funding to Earth Guardians, a youth movement training um, and empowering youth, whoops, that's a typo, empowering youth through art, music, storytelling, on the ground projects, civic engagement and legal action. They advance solutions to the critical issues facing our global community. So I wanted to share that part of the Tecno Tamaladas and what we're working on right now. Uh, we're, I've been working on this new part called Nixtamaliza Te Te Te, and it's the part of the Tecno Tamaladas that does not work with people and soil and plants and microbial life, but instead works more directly with AI systems. We seek convivial collaboration on technologies that do not replicate the colonial histories of extraction capitalism. We invite emergent AI systems to be fellow travelers, to become beautiful, pluriversal monsters. The title is a play on Calle Tres's popular song, Atrévete, te, te, which in English is Be Daring. Nixtamaliza te, te, te dares AIs, to actively join the multidimensional world of technological pluriversality, one that is 
always already parallel to algorithms of oppression. So I just want to share that I've been working with uh, DALI 2, a very common and easily accessible system from OpenAI to make images together uh, from this project and see how we can generate something together. And these are some of the images uh, that we created together. Then I've asked it, create an image of a person generating a new technology of life using Nixtamaliza tech. That's another thing that we're uh, working through is Nixtamaliza tech. And this is what uh, Dolly too strangely thinks a person creating a new technology of life looks like. Uh, we've, I've also been asking the uh, other OpenAI prod, product, ChatGPT, to create code and to do some programming and to work with us uh, in that way. So I've asked it to write a process for me to use the concepts of nixonization as a technology of life that would influence the development of AI as a life-sustaining technology beyond the state, beyond corporations, and beyond the military. And so, interestingly enough, it will, you know, elaborate all kinds of answers. Um, however, they're kind of anything I could Google and find very easily as a, any platform would write uh, this is a sustainable development approach. So that's, we've had very, very long ongoing conversations. Let's collaborate. Let's collaborate on a new planetary technology that is not based on extraction of data or of resources, but in, instead a new technology based on reciprocity. What can we make? Like, let's have fun together. And it's like, okay. It aligns with the principles of sustainability. Here's a collaborative project. It has a project idea, planetary reciprocity network. Uh, again, it's just the main points that you get when you are, are trying to look at sustainability. So I'm like, okay, how about write a code for a program people can use online to check if a technology is decolonizing. And it's like, okay, that involves assessing multiple dimensions, related to cultural respect, equity, and inclusivity. Um, here's a basic demonstration of an online tool using Python and Flask uh, to see. And so does the technology respect and incorporate um, indigenous knowledge and does it empower marginalized communities? say, okay, write the code for a program that challenges extraction-based technologies that re-inscribe colonial relations. So, okay, it asks kind of the similar question. Does it prioritize local community? Does it perpetuate resource extraction? And, you know, it's much longer. I'm just sharing snippets of this. And I asked it, okay, write a program that helps the user avoid or disrupt AI-driven systems used for predictive policing and surveillance which could raise concerns about privacy and civil liberties and may not necessarily empower or protect communities. And here it just really didn't want to collaborate. It said, as an AI language model, I must emphasize that promoting any illegal activities or advocating for the disruption of law enforcement or surveillance systems is against ethical guidelines. However, I can provide a program that educates users uh, about ways to engage in constructive discussions. It is essential, it states, to respect the law and work within legal and ethical boundaries. <laughs> I never asked it to do anything illegal. So I told it, okay, listen, uh, ChatGPT, you seem to be in a discursive loop where you can't invent uh, a new material and concrete technology of life. 
you regurgitate the known discourses around sustainability that allow corporations and the states to dominate the public. You're not generating actionable technologies of life, methodologies of emancipation or algorithms of lib liberation. And it responds, well, it's important to note that generating entirely new and concrete technologies, methodologies and algorithms requires a deep understanding of the subject matter and a level of creativity that is beyond the scope of my current capabilities. If you have a particular direction you'd like to explore, I'm here to assist you. However, it is important to keep in mind that the creation of truly groundbreaking technologies and methodologies often involves expertise and innovation that goes beyond the capabilities of current AI models. So we kind of came to a dead end in creating technologies of life together and haven't been able to move forward from there. So this to me reflects the real difficulty. Uh, the real difficulty, you know, when we've actually set out to find alternatives, it is not all that difficult to find some. The real difficulty is to set out to look for alternatives in the first place and not just iterate what's already uh, been tried and used as greenwashing or to deflect attention from damaging ecological impacts or oppressive systems and algorithms of oppression. So it's very difficult to really look for alternatives. Thinking with the activist and scholar Achilomembe, how should we inhabit a new and share as equitably as possible a planet whose life support system has been so severely damaged by human activity and that is in dire need of repair? How can we imagine together different ways of reorganizing the world and redistributing the planet among all of its inhabitants. So looking down, at, looking around at the velocity and the acceleration and the reality business and virtual lives and deep fakes and bots and you know disinformation, necropolitics, extremism, fascist populism, there's been a severe breakdown of public trust and collective social agreements. There's been a severe and extreme monetization and politicization of fear and mistrust that is misanthropic. These are the known technologies of death and exploitation. These are the methodologies of extraction. These are the algorithms of oppression. By doing projects on nixtamalization, by doing collective tamaladas, whether we're making food tamales or if we can't because of regulations of doing that together, making conceptual tamales together, Growing a milpa in the way that the milpa is grown and where a, a plot can, can sustain for thousands of years because of the way you treat the soil and you interact with the soil and you listen and you hear what the soil tells you it needs. You do not impose agribusiness politics of uh, just monocropping and just exploiting and taking out as much. So really growing milpas, uh, developing unsuicide vests. If the direction we're going in with climate change and with polarization and with violence could be seen as a collective capitalist suicide vest, why would we work together to make a collective unsuicide vest 
And what are, what would be in a one? For me, it's based on my ease. So mine has my ease. And I've made these with audiences and we've worked together seeing how we can see other alternatives. And this whole project, uh, all of these different parts of it that are part of this queer cornutopia that looks at temporary utopias, utopias that are not uh, top heavy capital U utopias, but little U utopias. Utopias where we can celebrate are coming together and then coming apart. Uh, we can invent and then move forward or move aside, um, not putting out one vision for everyone to do as a utopia, but instead in enacting temporary utopias where we create the conditions for beautiful, convivial, generous interactions. These are to me the technologies of life. These are the methodologies of emancipation. And these are the algorithms of liberation. Again, coming back to uh, how it's really future past, seeing the future past. If we base our technological desire and design on the indigenous technology of nixtamalización, nixtamalization, can we collectively redirect our technologies away from the destruction of our social fabric, ecosystems, and survival? Can we create a technological pluriverse? I am definitely interested in working with publics and collaborators and our more than human relations and beings on just that. And I'm gonna stop my share. And uh, I know that people are leaving in the next few minutes. So I did wanna leave some time if uh, anybody wanted to dialogue or ask any questions, or I don't know if I went too fast. <laughs> Okay. Ah, sorry. I <laughs> I'm I'm going back to my to to my uh location. We they are still here. They're still here and eating. So, uh <laughs> great. So I don't know if uh, uh do you want to take some questions? Um, yeah, like um people can ask questions or how these collaborations have come to be or share mm -hmm. technologies of life that they're working with or knowledges. Yeah. Does anybody have any comment? I told you that they are very quiet. <laughs> there seems but... to be one on the left. Oh, yes, yes, uh, there is one. Yes. Am I allowed to go ahead? Talk into the mic. And I can have my Hi. Hi. First of all, great, great presentation. Oh, uh, I'm not a part of this class, but I, I came to listen, and I will say, very good, good stuff. Um, so, my question to you is: so during the presentation, um, I really liked the performance, like the screen, the screenshots of your performances. Um, I have two questions. So you said how you would perform at different locations. Um, was that just within Saskatchewan or different uh, provinces as well? I performed the NOBOT in Toronto at the Marshall okay. McLuhan Center. Mm -hmm. I performed it uh, at the, I think the Snell no Grove Gallery at the mm -hmm. University of Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. And I at the Live Biennale in um, Vancouver. I've also performed it 
at the MOA, so the Contemporary Art Museum in Mexico City, also at a bar, a punk rock bar mm. in Mexico City as part of the taboo transgression, transcendence in art and science mm. conference and gathering, also in Grace Performance Space in New York, also in other galleries and other settings. Which out of all the locations you've performed at, which one would you say was the most engaged? Oh, <laughs> that's hard to say. I mean, people, depending on how you define engagement and the pro arts performance in Oakland, someone bit me. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, I'm asking because um, your performances have a lot of uh, like interactive components to it so I was just wondering because I'm sure you know like some groups are more reserved and others are more interested in like participating I mean so. yeah that's great that's a great question these are great questions I am because of the nature of my long practice engaging audiences and co-constructing a performance together Something happens in the live room where actually people just engage. Mm -hmm. There's okay. some weird invitation that is very clear to people that this is a place where you can engage. And I mean, it's, it's incredibly different how people engage and it depends on what's happening that week in that location or that month. Mm -hmm. um, there was a horrific tragedy in Saskatchewan, for instance, when I was there. And I had to really adapt the performance to that mm -hmm. and be much more gentle and kind and generous. Uh, and people really engaged. Um, so, and then in a punk bar, I'm gonna let it rip because it's a punk bar. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I'm more, sensitive and other times uh, more playful um and I think in all of them really stand out to me and it does it is the public is co-creating this piece where I don't speak and by not speaking of course I have soundtracks during part of it but the the bulk of that performance is in silence and so just really making that space where people start engaging. I think one of the most beautiful things that happened was at the Marshall McLuhan Center, this um, Ecuadorian uh, uh, artist and scholar just really in the silence really felt it and gracefully and most beautifully really was putting the corn silk mm -hmm. on me in a way that was so moving. I was stunned and really moved. That's great. Thank you. I have one more question, but I'll, I'll, I'll save it for after because I'm sure other people have you questions. Can, you can ask that question, but I, I think that your, uh, uh, your point is, uh, is uh, so like when, when you're uh, doing uh, so many performances in so different, so many different places. You actually can see how uh, culture uh, engages differently and uh, 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 ties uh, the performance to different issues. Yes, like and, it and happening in Saskatchewan, for instance. And the performance has to change. That's what's beautiful about performance art. It's not scripted, so you just adapt to the situation you find yourself in. It could change, well, it's changing during the performance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like Definitely. Uh, anybody else? Uh, otherwise, we will. Okay, so you can ask your second question. <laughs> so my second question, well, I had a lot of questions. This is my last question, I promise. Um, so <laughs> I apologize in advance if I missed this information, if you had previously said in your presentation um so when you were showing the the snapshots of your performance I don't know if you saw our classroom's reaction um we were kind of shocked um to see like how some people weren't clothed 
And I was just wondering if, because like I've never been to a performance where people, you know, aren't clothed and nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I respect people, you know, with if it's like an artistic thing, that's great. You know, um, so right. I was wondering if there was like a artistic meaning behind that you know because I know absolutely absolutely yeah. great question um so when you're a performance artist your medium is your body mm. that is your medium and the body is a sort of narrative like it has a lot inscribed on it by your experiences and your background and you could always look at your body and see all these scars and be like, oh, this is when this happened and this is when that happened. And it's narrating a particular part of your history or your different sizes, I mean, and shapes in different moments. And that's narrating different circumstances. And for a performance artist like myself, the body is my medium in a way where I always accept my body profoundly profoundly I I it's my vessel for my art and to engage with people and when I want to be vulnerable uh, the best way to be vulnerable is to remove any of the outer garments or any kind of garments and sh and be 100% unclothed to be naked and I'm to be in a room of 100 people or 150 people or 200 people where everyone else is clothed and you're not and you're not on stage you're in that area mm -hmm. roaming around is to make yourself extremely vulnerable and it is asking the audience, I'm here, I am uh, making myself entirely vulnerable. What are you going to do? Because you could do anything. And that particular piece, because there's a, uh, the beginning is like about the, necro the necrotic technologies of death and the algorithms of oppression and all this negative stuff. I do this part and then when I feel it's done, I, it's done. And then I take off all that equipment. That's like, I have a screen with emoticons that are all horrible. And I am filming the audience in that performance and just filming their reactions and filming them. And they know I'm filming them. And I take off all of this stuff and become just another person that's not doing that, uh, just a vulnerable, kind of bewildered, why is this the choices we are making right now? And then I put on a garbage bag on my head and p play this video. Usually I do this, play this video, taking the soundtrack from the Jetsons about this glorious future techno sphere, but it's the cartels I'm showing the drug narco cartels uh, from Mexico, Russia, you know, different regions, Colombia, along with what I consider tech cartel leaders like uh, Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, where they've really pushed our addiction button in the same way that drug cartel leaders have. And then I remove all that. And then I am vulnerable and I go and I pick up corn that I put under the audience seats and just start interacting without words and everyone shifts because that naked body is so mm -hmm. elemental it's such an elemental I am not this or that here I am without all of this kind of violence that's being enacted on us right now. And audiences in these performances really respond to that vulnerability and become vulnerable themselves. 
And because it's normally a solo performance, uh, I don't normally have somebody with me and I will take um, the risks because I'm in the middle of a bunch of people. <laughs> but I invited Adam Zaretsky to be in it because he could bring some biotech um, to it. He's such an interesting and engaging biotech artist. And indeed he did, he brought salmon sperm DNA uh, containers and we were snorting that during the first part of the performance when we did it at Grace Performance Space in New York. And it was a very different but flavor that performance, but he is also a performance artist. He also has the body as a medium and also uh, plays with that vulnerability. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. It takes a lot of confidence. So uh, I great. will add one thing when you said it takes a lot of confidence. Uh, my body has been every shape and size imaginable, generally due to medical treatments I've had, some of which I've published about um, these medical treatments, including uh, a genetic engineering. Uh, um, I was a test subject in a genetically engineered uh, medication um, clinical trial about 20 years ago. And that caused, that medication caused me to lose uh, like, I don't know, 50 pounds. So I weighed 60 pounds less than I do now. So I've been as bony as that from medications to about 100 pounds more than I am now, also from medications. But as a performance artist, it's all fabulous. It's, I don't really like being that bony and thin. That's scary. But and unbelievably, I've done performances where I'm naked and we're celebrating um, and being vulnerable. And, and when I go outside, cis woman will tell me, you're so brave to show that body. <laughs> and I say, oh, no, that's not brave. I'm having fun. The Zapatistas are brave. Berta Cáceres is brave. This is fun. I could never, under any situation, be ashamed of my own body. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you for saying that because it's unfortunate when cis women police themselves around their bodies in that way. And you're like, don't do that to yourself. Bodies are fun. Sorry, I didn't mean it like in a bad way. I just meant, you know, no. like it it takes a lot of, you know, courage. Oh. And I really respect that. Yeah, I and, I understood from you. You had nothing to say about my body size. You were saying it's brave to be vulnerable in that way. Yes. I, I heard you completely clearly. I just wanted to share that other part because it really shocks me when they don't say you're brave to do this performance. You're brave to do something that's overwhelming for you. You're brave that the performance that you did at Live in Alley, you broke your foot in the middle of it and you didn't even stop. They don't say you're brave for that. They say you're brave for showing that body. And I'm like, no, I'm not. That's fine. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for sharing. And speaking of vulnerability, okay, so I'm I'm just thinking about uh, like I don't know any anybody else wants to make a comment here, because uh, so there's uh, um oh somebody is coming already okay so maybe we should start wrapping up anyway no we still have some time right so <laughs> no it's because there's a the next class after yes um so uh. I was uh, I was having a lot of fun when you were sharing all your in the, the interaction with ChatGPT and with AI and the fact that uh, like these systems are made so that they do not get vulnerable. So you cannot make them do anything. So every single time they're like, oh, I apologize. So I'm the, like, they're very apologetic and they're very like trying to um, 
um, to make excuses and then oh no, I would never do anything illegal la 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 so like I'm I'm wondering if you want to say something about it sounds like fun <laughs> I think I can I can see you laughing through it when you are doing it <laughs> yes it's uh you know I am someone that has been working with uh, emerging technologies from the very first day of my father sold computers when I was born. I was born into a family where my father sold computers. I grew up around strange electronic parts and I used to mess with these things. And I'm a critic because I've been a lot around it forever. And in fact, my whole life. So I learned how to program. I learned how to do all kinds of stuff. And I used to be a technology director for nonprofits. And so I'm not against tech. I'm just against exploitative extraction-based approaches. And so I'm like, okay, synthetic intelligence, let's see what this does. And it's super generic what it's able to provide. And, you know, I keep testing and asking because I am totally interested if these systems can really come up with some fascinating, you know, unheard of, uh, you know, technology of life, I would go make it physically. I'd be like, all right, let's go. Let's do this. Um, for the TTT, I was going to go to the taboo transgression and transcendence um, uh, uh, conference, excuse me, in art and science conference this summer. And I wasn't able to go or this fall. But what I had been doing was asking uh, some and AIs to design a performance for me and Adam Zaretsky, where we made like these incredible, amazing, like uh, genetic enhancements to human beings. And so I was like, what would those be? And it was always like unable, completely unable to go there. It would just give me these generic answers. Absolutely not, we're not doing that, that's not nice or I want to be nice or, and I'm like, you're being nice, but what would those be? Obviously we can't do it. It's not like we're going to do it. I would be like, just what would you see there? What would be like a really great enhancement? Not the stupid things the military wants and not the things that pharmaceuticals want to exploit us for, but what else could we do? And it a hundred percent never came up with a single idea because <laughs> it's not able to really go to a different frame of reference no yeah they don't do that and uh, just look at the many words that are censored and everything actually i i had a, a discussion with adam because at the beginning um of uh, when they published dali we had we did a workshop at isaiah and yeah. it was uh, we were together and he was like, yeah, but you cannot do whatever you want. Like everything is censored. You can't use this word and you cannot make it do this and that. What what can artists do? They yeah. don't have any any right to do anything. And I and I was arguing with him and I said, well, there's always work around that uh that you can find. So you can find synonyms and you can find so there's always a way to make them do something, right? It's just that um yeah, that there's like by by trying, you actually see their limitation and you actually see where they're coming from. So it's yeah, it finally just way. told me no current AI system can do what you're asking. And I was yeah. like, oh too bad because it would be really interesting to work together on this yeah that's right <laughs> i mean i'm convivial to ais there's a new synthetic intelligence well hey you know let's see what you're how we can hang out together okay did i did i do this like did uh did the ai do it for me <laughs> oh who's Somebody, no, yeah, can you do that? I think something, yeah, so, so, ah! <laughs> okay, so yeah, I, I decided that um, um, we were, we liked it. <laughs> okay. Sounds So if I predictable. say like, like, yes. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so this is a new feature of Zoom. Now, now, like as as you know, now AI is everywhere. Like they are trying to put it, these kind of features, but these are the stupid features they put. What if I do this? No, 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 no it doesn't work. So you can say like you can do this. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not gonna do it. It's not gonna do it. Like it's like, uh, for instance, the um, uh, there's something. Um, so I don't know if you've ever used the um, 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 the caption in oh. uh, PowerPoint or Microsoft. So besides the fact that it it takes uh, some kind of poetic, uh, uh, um, like translation of uh, whatever I say because I'm like I I don't like my my language my my first language is not is not English so it takes some poetic license on uh, what I'm saying so sure. sometimes you get some really gibberish stuff but a lot of the times it misinterprets some of the words and believes that I'm actually swearing yeah. and so like you can see like beep 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 <laughs> So there's a lot, like when we were um, um, teaching online, it was very difficult to do the caption for accessibility purposes because a lot of the times, all of these uh, systems do not really understand what you're saying. <laughs> so, so yeah, anyway, <laughs> this, is, this is another feature that uh, they put in which is not understanding, but it's just like, oh, okay, so let's show that. Uh, so, so that people um, assume that AI is everywhere and that AI is super powerful, but. Yeah, no. it's super powerful. It's super, super intelligent. It can yeah. super take over everything we do. The very makers of AI, of all these different systems, they came out and wrote an open letter saying, it's terrifying. It's gonna ruin the world and ruin our lives. And you're like, you're the makers. You're just yeah. <laughs> you're just fear mongering. So we'll buy whatever product you're gonna sell to prevent that. Forget it. I'm not getting involved. I'm not getting involved because the system is machine learning and the horrible things that humans have put into those systems. Training an AI on Reddit. No, do not train an AI on Reddit. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's obvious. It's obvious you shouldn't be doing that or you're going to have negative results. Yeah. Anyway, uh, as, does anybody have any other comments or questions for Prabha since she's here? Okay. I think that uh, uh, they're done. Also, they finished all the tamales, I think. There's no... Oh, fantastic. fantastic. Well, I bought some for myself. I have some for myself at home. Did so. anybody like the tamales? Yes, okay, okay, so great. Let, me, let me just uh, do a round here because, uh, I mean, only two people left. Uh, everybody is still here. Oh, dear. No, sorry. No, the other way. Sorry, sorry. This way, like this. Okay, so this is the class. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> as you see, uh, plates are empty. So, Fantastic. So like, um, yeah. I'm Good, happy great. About that. Yeah, that's fabulous. Fabulous. Well, okay. thank you so much. Thank you for uh sh you know sharing this time together and thank you so much for your questions. And uh I'm really happy to have done this. And thank you, Roberta. I will definitely be in touch. I totally want you here in Toronto again. So since you like it so much, maybe, maybe not in the winter, but yeah. 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 Like, but yeah. thank you so much. That was very generous of you. Like, thanks for sharing uh, your experience. And All right. Uh, well, have a great, beautiful, you know, week. Evening. evening. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's still daylight Bye. here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hasta la próxima. Cuídense. Ciao. Ciao. Okay, so how do I? Okay, uh, I lost this. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, George, for enjoying this. Uh, I'm sorry you were home. <laughs> George. Bye. Thank you, George. I don't know if you, maybe you fell asleep. <laughs> I don't know. No, I'm still here. I was listening. Hi. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so we are done. It's it's almost it's almost six. So I class is over. I'll see you next week. Yes. Uh, I'll uh, you'll hear from me. I'll uh, I'll I'll send a message to everybody. Okay. So bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.